What's going on, everybody? You guys doing all right? Hmm, okay. I'll take your word for it. All right. Hey, uh, welcome, everyone. No matter where you're at, if you're online, guys, we're so glad that you joined us. If you're here for the first time, we're really proud of you, first of all, because stepping into a church environment can sometimes be scary. You're the guest of honor today, so welcome. We're so glad you are here. Look at somebody beside you and say, glad you're here. Yeah, it's good. Hey, today's going to be a good day. It's going to be a good day. We get to open up the Word of God today and allow it to speak to us. And what's special about the Word of God is that it doesn't speak to our physical, doesn't speak to our emotional. It goes through that and speaks to our spiritual selves. And that's where true change occurs in the emotional and physical. God created you as a spiritual being, and He wants to speak into your spirit today. And you know, those doors are the difference between us staying here and walking out. And I pray that before we walk out those doors, that God does super, something supernatural here today, that he speaks to your spirit, and that he refreshes you, that you know him in a new way, and that you love him more dearly and more closely. So let's just pray for that right now. God, we commit this time to you. God, I pray that you would do a deep work in us. God, I pray that you would speak to our spirits. God, I pray that we would walk out of here changed. God, that you would show us a little more of who you are. God, I pray for whatever heaviness is going on in this room. God, I pray that you would lift people up today, that you would lift up their spirits. God, I pray that anything that I say that isn't of you would wither and fade away, but God, that your word would stand forever and that, that it would stick with us. So we just commit this time to you, and we expect you to do great things because you are a great God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to get started today. Hey, what we talk about today is predicated on these two scriptures. The first is in Ephesians. The second is in 1 Peter. Let's look at the first. Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And then 1 Peter 2, 9 says, but you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, Highlands Church, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Do you believe that today? Come on. Look at somebody and tell them, you're chosen. You're chosen. That's right. Now, uh, keep that in your back pocket as I make a great transition into my story. Um, you know, if no one's told you that having kids leads itself to some pretty gross experiences, let me be the first, okay? Like, guys... Just childbirth in general, I didn't know. I walked into that room blind, and I got my eyes opened. And that's just the start, right? It's amazing to me how something so cute and small can produce the kind of odors and substances that it does. Yeah? Like, the other week, I was hanging out with my youngest two-year-old, Ella, and she pulled something out of her nose that was like the size of a planet. I, I, don't, I don't know, the texture, like, it was just shiny, and it was right there, and she lifted it up. And you know what I did? I took it right off her finger, and I flicked it in the grass. <laughs> right? Like, it doesn't matter how gross it is. It doesn't matter what the smell or consistency is. It could be like one of those 28 wipers. Something about being the mom or the dad, you just have this ability to power through that moment. But have you ever noticed if it's anybody else's kid? 
Yeah. Uh-uh. You smell it, you're going right back to mom. There you go. There's a little present for you. You take that snot and you go right back to dad. He's right there. He'll take care of that for you. That is truth right there. There's something about it being your own kid that you are committed in love to cleaning them up. And you know what? That's how God sees you too. God's not scared of your mess. Doesn't matter what color or substance or consistency it is. God's not scared of your mess. And he has no issue washing you and making you clean. And he is committed to the process. Let's look at John 13, 1 through 17, and we're going to power through these 17 verses. It says, before the, pa- before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his time, that his hour, had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water in a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash your feet, unless I wash you, you do not or you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, Then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. And Jesus replied, A person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, Not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done. I tell you the truth. Slaves are no greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Now let's talk a little context, because context brings clarity. The, the, the Passover dinner was a celebration of Israel escaping Egypt. You remember, remember that movie, Prince of Egypt? Like when God sends that final plague, the angel of death, and they put the blood of the lamb on their door, on their door frames. And that plague was the last plague because Pharaoh released them and freed them from bondage and slavery. And it's not a coincidence that they are celebrating the Passover meal right before Jesus' death. So this day is a little bit like our 4th of July, right? It's a celebration of freedom. Like, super excited, we've gotten rid of the British, and we are free to do our own thing. Super excited, the Egyptians, they're not in control of our lives anymore. We're not slaves, and we are free now. And then this Passover dinner, and this washing of the feet before dinner, what would typically occur is that the lowest servant in the room would wash the people's feet before they ate dinner. And rabbis now say that even a Jewish slave or servant would not be given such a task because it was so demeaning. 
It was a job reserved for the lowest of low. And that's the point. Jesus took the lowest position in the room. Philippians 2, 7 says, Instead, he, Jesus, gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. The title of this message is called Humble Confidence. Humble Confidence. On August 26, 1910, a little girl was born in Skopje, Macedonia. From the time she was young, she knew God had a, had a special calling on her life to spread God's love around this world. Later, she went to Ireland to be trained as a nun, and then from there she was sent to India, where she took her vows as a nun. And she was, she was drawn towards the impoverished, the destitute, and the helpless. And in 1948, she started a school in the slums for kids. In 1950, she was eventually given permission to start her own order, the Missionaries of Charity. And their focus, their focus was on the least of these. Those who, who couldn't care for themselves anymore, that, that society wouldn't care for anymore. And this, this order spread around the world through over 40 countries, serving the homeless, those with HIV and AIDS, chronic disease, and even leprosy. And she said this, At the end of life, we will not be judged by how many diplomas we have received, how much money we have made, or how many great things we have done. We will be judged by, and she quotes scripture, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was homeless, and you took me in. We all know her as Mother Teresa, and she's pretty much a global name, right? And even in all her fame, she said this, If you are humble, nothing can touch you, neither praise nor disgrace, because you know what you are. Now, I would say that's a kind of humble confidence. And that's the kind of humble confidence that Jesus calls us to. And it's found when our spirits are at rest with God, operating in the fullness of, of who he's called you to be, his chosen people. Look at somebody else and count, tell them, you're chosen. You're chosen. You are chosen. Live in that. See, it's only through knowing who you are and whose you are that we can serve and be the least of these. And that's our first point. You see, Jesus could serve because he knew who he was and whose he was. Let's look at verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, poured water into a basin, then began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a, the towel he had around him. See, I would suggest to you that we have an identity crisis, not only in the church, but also in our nation right now. Because we have had things spoken over us and in us that we are carrying with us and we live out. Some of you are even speaking them over yourself. They have become who you are. You know, um, my kids, and if I'm honest, sometimes I say this, we have a phrase that we say, and, and it kind of bothers me. When something's frustrated, frustrates us, or an event happens that's upsetting, it, it's real easy to say, you make me mad. That makes me upset. That makes me frustrated. That makes me this. That makes me that. That makes me 
Great power is given to something or someone when you allow them to make you. Because there is only one who makes you. All others try to influence you, and whether they succeed or not is up to you. See, some of you have had things spoken over you and in you that are not true. I'm an idiot. I'm worthless. I'm stupid. I'm a bad mom. I'm a bad dad. I come from a line of brokenness, and that's just who I am. That's my lot. I'm an alcoholic. I'm an addict. I'm divorced. I'm never going to get over that experience. But let's look, let's look back at Genesis. Genesis 1, 27, it says, So God created you. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. And when we live in that context, I don't know what's been spoken over you. I don't know what mountain you're standing in front of. I don't know what you're going through in your life. But when we live in that context, nothing can stop God from working. Nothing is impossible for him. So when we stand in the confidence of knowing who we are and whose we are, we can look at the mountain in front of us and we can say, be cast into the sea. And in that power, God moves things in the spiritual that we can't move in the physical. God does his work his way. When we believe that, know who you are and whose you are. Remember 1 Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. You're special to him. You're special. That you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Like, do you really know that? Do you really believe it? Because if you do, it'll change your life. If that's your life anthem, if that's what you walk into your day with every single morning, I think it would change some of the interactions you have with life. Jesus knew. Jesus knew. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything. And that he had come from God and returned to God, so he got up. So he got up. And that word so is a conjunctive adverb expressing consequence. And I did have to look that up on Google. A conjunctive adverb expressing confidence. So one thing leads to another. When you know whose you are and who you are, you can get up from the table and start serving with a humble confidence. So what does that look like in your life? Like, listen, when your identity is so tightly wrapped around the fact that you are God's, like you are his child, he is your refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble, you can operate in a humble confidence, no matter where you find yourself in life. And that kind of humble confidence comes from knowing the Word, which is our second point. And see, the Word and God are synonymous, because when you know the Word, you know God. And I think that as a generation, we have become so easily influenced because we have lost the art of hiding God's Word in our heart, right? Like, okay, faith is good, because without faith, it is impossible to please God. And in Scripture, we see that faith is a shield and that the Word of God is a sword, like the sword of the Spirit. But I think a lot of us use the shield and forget the sword, and that's why we're continuing to live lives of defense instead of victory. Because the sword is a weapon of great victory. The shield is a good weapon for defense. You know, you ever heard the phrase, like, don't walk into a, a, a gunfight with a knife? Like, don't walk into a sword fight with just a shield. You're going to continue to lead a life of defense, but what if? 
What if we walked in with the sword, and not just any sword, but God's sword, the kind of sword that when the enemy sees it, it makes them flee, the kind of sword that when we pull that out and we quote scripture, that enemy disappears. That is where we find our humble confidence. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. Put scripture in your heart and start winning. Know whose you are and who you are. I think the, the enemy has attacked our identity and crippled our ability to serve with confidence and impact the world around us. Identify yourself as a child of God and move forward in serving the people he's called you to serve. And in general, that's just the people in close proximity around you. And let 1 Peter 2.9 be your creed. Let that be your anthem as you serve. Know whose you are and who you are. Like, would you memorize that with me this week? Like, would you put that in your heart? And as you encounter opportunities to serve, don't see it as demeaning. See it as an opportunity to follow Jesus in the way he served. It's the foundation to humble confidence. And it comes by allowing Jesus to wash your feet. See, this is sequential. This is our next point. Accepting Jesus washing our feet teaches us and inspires us to serve others. Now, I want to introduce something to you. So we have our water and towel and a basin here. I, I'm going to call someone to come up here. Nobody wants to come up here. Let's be honest, right? You do not come to church today for the most awkward moment of 2022. Right? I'm not going to have anyone come up here. But, um, but I think that just that feeling that was just <laughs> elicited through my, <laughs> I'm going to call someone up here. <laughs> I think we can hang on to that for, for, for a minute. Like, I've been a part of a number of foot washings. They're all awkward. Trust me, but they're all meaningful. And it, it, it's not like going to get a pedicure, right? It's completely different. Because someone's committed to the process of washing you. And the gospel is offensive, and that's part of the offense of the gospel, is that we have to be washed. Like, we have to to let Jesus wash us. And if you think it, it would have been awkward to come up here and have Tyler wash your feet, what about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? What about having Jesus wash your feet? Kneeling down, taking your shoes off, and scrubbing you clean. But remember, we're his kids. He loves us, and he's committed to the process. It requires him washing our feet, and he doesn't mind. He wants to. In fact, he bent this time and space continuum to step out of heaven so that he could purify us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Like, I feel, I feel a little bit like Peter, though, if I'm honest. Like, no, -uh, no, God, no, Jesus, you're not going to wash my feet. But you know what Jesus said to that? If I don't wash your feet, you don't have any part with me. You can't be a part of what I'm doing. Like, Peter had walked with Jesus. Peter had walked on water with Jesus. He had performed miracles in Jesus' name. Yet Jesus still said, unless I wash you, you don't belong to me. Like Jesus didn't say, unless I wash you and you go perform miracles, unless I wash you and you show up on church, or you show up to church on Sunday, unless I wash you and this and that and the other thing. He said, no, unless I wash you, period. See, belonging to Jesus 
does not depend on our work. It is holy. It wholly relies on allowing Jesus to wash us. And when I asked for someone to come up earlier, like maybe there's some pits in people's stomach, but as awkward as that is, Jesus wants to do so much more than wash your feet. You see, Jesus doesn't just ask to kneel down and wash your feet. He asks to lay down on a cross. He has to lay down on a cross and take the punishment for your sin and my sin in his body to, to accept and receive the nails in his hands and his feet that were meant for us. Like, can we accept that? If it's hard to accept Tyler washing your feet, can we accept the fact that Jesus has to lay down on a cross? He has to lay down on a cross and be murdered for us. Because if it wasn't him, it would have been us. He has to take our sin in his body. There's no other substitute. He has to wash us. He has to cleanse us. He wants to do so much more than wash your feet. He wants to purify you. He wants to take something dead and bring it to life. He wants you to be a new person in him. And there's only one way. There's only one way. If you let him, if you let him take your sins in his body and be broken for you, and in that great transfer, there's freedom. There's an escape from Egypt and the bondage. There's an escape for you, and his name is Jesus. And he's not afraid of your mess. He wants to take that booger, and he wants to take it off your finger and flick it right into the grass because it doesn't exist anymore. Your sins are as far as the east is from the west. Jesus has taken them, and he has dealt with them. They are gone now. And you see, without that, there can't be communion with him. See, we can't exist in his holiness without him washing us. There's no way to be a part of the holy nation that Peter was referring to in that verse because sin cannot exist in God's holiness. And when we really, really, really understand that, when we really get how Jesus has served us, and how we belong to him. We can serve this world and the people around us with a kind of humble confidence that only comes from knowing whose we are and who we are. And it's, an, and it's out of an understanding of that kind of love that we serve. So in conclusion, I leave you with the process. See the need. Like, some of us just need to look around the table and see the dirty feet, right? Some of us just need to look up from what we're doing, take a moment, and see the need around us, because I promise you, there is need around us right now. And our second step is to get up. Get up. The church, all of us, we are people of action. Jesus called us to a great commission which requires action. It requires getting up and doing something. But the third thing, we're going to have to lay something aside like it's going to cost us something. Like you're going to have to give away a resource in order to follow Jesus and serve the kind of way that he served others. So after that, after we get up and lay something aside, we're going to get our work pants on, we're going to get dirty, we're going to serve, and then we're going to sit back down again in confidence with no need for praise or adoration. Not that those things are bad, but Jesus, Jesus already did it. And we're just following him in that. And that's enough. So who do I serve? Who are the least of these? Who, who are the people around me? Who I can serve. Well, there's a group of people a hundred feet from us right now who need you. 
our kids, our youth. And there are people in this room right now who need to walk out these doors after this service and go to the connections area and sign up to serve our kids. Because I hear a lot of talk about the next generation, but I don't really see a lot of action. And some of us need to step into that arena and be a part of what God is doing because God is still moving in the next generation and he is waiting for people to follow him in that and serve with a humble confidence. It might not be easy and it might not be fun all the time, but neither was getting down on his knees and washing the disciples' feet. And we can follow Jesus outside these doors and serve our next generation well. We can serve the homeless. Hope of the Valley is right out here under a tent. Ask them how to get involved. I think they're in Palmdale on Monday and Tuesday, and then they're in Lancaster on Thursday and Friday. Ask how to get involved and serve the, ho- serve the homeless. The first-time guest, you see someone new here, extend a hand. Introduce yourself, your neighbor, your boss, your spouse, your parents, your kids. God has placed people around you for you to serve. And I want to point something out. We all know it, but I just, I just need to say it. Like Jesus washed everyone's feet around the table. Even Judas's. The least of these and the worst of these. Jesus took the most humble position in the room. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared in advance for us to do. See, God's already prepared things for us. All we have to do is look up and step into them. And I'll close with this, and I got this from EnduringWord.com, and I pretty much quote it verbatim. See, Jesus rose from supper— a place of rest and comfort. Just like he rose from the throne of heaven, a place of rest and comfort. He laid aside his garments, taking off his heavenly covering, taking off his covering, just like he laid aside glory, taking off his heavenly covering. He took a towel and wrapped it around himself, ready to work. He took the form of a servant, and came ready to work. Jesus poured water into a basin ready to clean, and Jesus poured out his blood to cleanse us from the guilt and penalty of sin. Jesus sat down after washing their feet, and Jesus sat down at the right hand of God after cleansing us. That is the kind of God we serve. That is the kind of God we follow, who stepped into our world, did not require us to come to him, but he came to us to receive our brokenness, our mess in his body so that the relationship between him and us could be restored. He came that we might know his grace, his power, and his love. And he laid it all down for us so that we could be in relationship with him and live with him and worship him for eternity. That is our God. So know who you are and whose you are. Allow Jesus to wash your feet and follow the process. John 13, 17. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. I want to take a moment before we close, and then we're going to go into communion. But um, I just want to take a moment. You guys can set things aside and and bow your heads. Because, you know, we're, we're his kids. God loves us. He's not afraid of our mess. He chose us in advance. Before time, God saw you. 
And he knew that today was going to occur. And maybe there are some people in this room or online who know that, that they're a mess, but they also know that they are God's child, and he's not afraid of their mess. And he wants to wash you, and he wants to purify you, and he wants to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and all the stuff that was a part of your past. He wants to take away so that you have freedom moving forward. He wants to change your life. He wants to take something that's dead and restore it to life. If that's you, if, if, if God is speaking to you right now and, and you want to put your full faith and trust in Jesus, proclaiming that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that nobody comes to the Father except through him, if you want to repent of all that mess in your life and, 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 and you have the courage to accept Jesus not only washing your feet, but laying down on a cross for you, to take all that stuff away so that you could have life and life to the fullest. I want you to be brave today and I want you to just put your hand up as a, as a sign that, that you want to accept Jesus washing you. And I see that hand, yeah. And making you clean and purifying your heart and doing something for you. I see that. That's good. Tell your mom. Doing something for you that you just can't do yourself. I see a hand over here. That you say, Jesus, I want to live for you. You take my past. I see you over here as well. You take my past, and I'm going to live for you, not only in this future, but in the eternal future. I'm going to live for you. Pray this prayer. God, receive me. Receive all of me. God, forgive me for my past, and I accept your forgiveness today, God. God, help me to walk forward as I am a new creation now. Help me to walk forward in the power that you have given me today. Help me to know whose I am and who I am in you. I want to pursue you with everything that I am. Take my life today, Lord. Make it new. And give me the faith and the strength to walk with you and for you. Give me a humble confidence to serve like you served. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give it up for the people who just gave their life to Christ right now? It's a big deal. Hey, if you don't have communion, go ahead and put your hand up and we'll get it to you. And um, you could probably start to open these since it takes about three minutes to get it open. <laughs> I struggle with this every time. Um, I think it's appropriate that we're taking communion. And you know, in, in the church that I grew up in, there was a table in the front. And it said, I just dropped it. <laughs> and it said, do this in remembrance of me. And yes, I, I think that we should do this, that we should take this in remembrance of me. But I also think that there's something else to that statement as well. Because when Jesus took the bread, said he took the bread and he broke it. And then he took the cup and he said, this cup is the blood of a new covenant, the forgiveness of sins. And I think that doing this, when Jesus said do this, he meant be broken like I was. Be broken for your community and be poured out for those around you, just like I poured myself out for you. So when you take this bread, before you take it, I want, I want you to put some pressure on it. And I want you to break it. And I want it to remind you that Jesus was broken for you. Feel the brokenness and understand that Jesus came to restore you 
by being broken for you. So he took the bread, he broke it, and he said, take this and eat it. You can go ahead and eat it. And then he said he took the cup, and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you. And he said, take and drink it. So God, I pray as, as we've taken these elements that it would remind us of your great love for us and that it would empower us to serve with a humble confidence just like you came to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand with us and continue to worship?